the um, the the topic here is piano arranging today, and I've taught this session a couple of times at Alleluia before. Maybe some of you have been involved in this session with me. Um, it's kind of a good time for me to teach it because I'm I'm just coming out of writing a book. Uh, I have a brand new book that has come out with Lorenz. Uh, I think Molly uh, might have uh, talked through this earlier today if she was uh, in her keyboard reading session, if you were a part of that. And uh, I'm really excited that uh, I am now working for Lorenz. I am the keyboard editor for Lorenz and, and also a choral editor for Lorenz. And so right now I've just finished writing my book and I'm going through and editing tons of of keyboard music. So my mind is really in piano arranging right now, which is which is a good thing. So this is a uh, an, an appropriate um, session for me to teach right now. So um, if you take a look at the handout that I gave you, and hopefully everyone has access to that, um, I am a, a former college teacher, and so I love my I love my handouts. Oh, Michael says I'm on and I'm looking good. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Sorry for the issues. Well, as long as I'm on and looking good, that's good enough for me. Um, anyway, I, uh, I, I, the professor in me comes out when I do my handout. So I've, uh, I've created a handout for you that I want you to, uh, to take a look at. And we're going to really quickly, since we get started late in about the next 40 minutes, we're going to um, zip through all of these things really, really quick. And give you some ideas for how you start to put together your own um, piano arrangement. I'm assuming some of you have probably attempted it before. Um, I will also say that because of the, you know, we have 40 minutes together, that I, I will throw out a lot of things to you. And I might not necessarily be able to explain the theory behind it. Um, Michael, Tony is saying that she can't see the handout. I don't know uh, where they can access that. Um, but if you can help her out, that would be great. Tony Sullivan just uh, said she could see the handout. Uh, and then they're saying handout not attached. So I, I don't know where we, can, where we can find it. If we can't find it, it's okay. I can, I can walk you through everything and, and give you everything that's on it. Um, but it would be valuable if they if they could have it because I've got some some music actually attached in the handout. I don't know. Okay. Well, because we we yeah another one is Lily is saying she can't see the handout either. So let me let me go ahead and move forward without the handout and we'll see if they can they can get that uh, attached or not. But. Uh, I won't be able to uh, go into a lot of the theoretical details of some of these things that I talk about because we just don't have time. But uh, maybe I can at least throw some things out there that can kind of uh, spark your creativity with, uh, with some of the, the music that you want to write and arrange. So the very first thing on my handout, if you did have my handout, and I realize you don't, but I have uh, a little title there, which I'd love for you to write down on your notes if, if you don't have anything, uh, the handout in front of you, called Tricks of the Trade. And so the very first thing that I want to uh, show you or talk to you about are just some very general things that you can think about when you're starting to do a piano arrangement. We, you know, we're faced with a challenge of, you know, if you if you look at how many um, hymns there are in the hymn book on a typical, you know, the typical church sings, there might be 400 hymns in the hymn book, but I bet most churches probably only sing 40 or 50 of them. And so when you're arranging these things and you're trying to find something new and creative, something that hasn't been said before with some of these hymns, it can be a little bit of a uh, little bit of a challenge. The very first thing that you can experiment with and if you'll jot this down, this can be helpful for you. It's what I call altered time signatures. Altered time signatures, okay? Now, what do I mean by altered time signatures? It, it's really simple. You take something that is in, you know, say 4-4, four, four, and you move it into 3-4, right? You take something that's in 3-4, move it somewhere else. Take something in 
uh, four, four and put it in five, four. Uh, you really can find a lot of fresh material with that. Now I, I am going to shamelessly be selling this book to you today. Uh, and if, and when you are able to get your, your handout, uh, you'll see that the second page of it contains the, uh, the title page of the first song in the book, which is called come ye thankful people come. We all know this, right? Thanksgiving hymn. Well, how is, what is come ye thankful people come usually in come ye thankful people come? It's in 4-4, four, four, right? Usually in 4-4. Four, four. Well, I love experimenting with mixed meters. And so I wanted to do something really kind of celebratory with this piece. And so I thought, boy, what, what if we could put it in, I don't know, 7-4 or 5-4 or something like that. I spent a lot of time experimenting with it. And I ended up putting it in 5-4. Okay, now, unfortunately, again, you might not can see the music. I did have the first page, but this is a little bit of what it sounds like. I have a dual screen set up, so I'm, I'm looking at my screen and playing on my piano here. It's right in front of me, so I apologize for looking this way. But all this is introduction. And then here's the tune. Can you hear it? And so forth, right? So I when I'm, when I'm arranging something, I really, a lot of times, particularly with more upbeat celebratory music, I will have a lot of fun seeing if there's some kind of different uh, time signature that I can move things into from what you might normally expect. It immediately makes the tune sound fresh and new. How do you do that? Well, you know, it's just experimenting. Uh, honestly, it really is. There's no uh, secret formula for it. You, you want to arrange joy to the world? Well, in your mind, you you kind of, you know, it's in 4-4, four, four. you say, okay, I'm going to see what it might sound like in 3-4, and how can I make that work? Singing it out loud while maybe you conduct it is, is a good thing. Um, you might put it in 5-4. I did, um, in an early book I did for Lorenz years ago, a book called Born the King of Angels, I put Hark the Herald Angels Sing in 7-4, and I did it as three uh, bar 3-4 three, four plus 4-4. Four, four. Uh, so it would be like, hark the herald angel sing, glory to the newborn king, you know. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. I've had a lot of uh, pianists that write back and say, man, that's such a, a nice arrangement and fun to play. So the very first thing that I want to throw out to you is that when you arrange a piece of music, you do not have to be... Uh, you do not have to regulate yourself to the time signature that the piece is initially in. Um, the second thing okay, that I want to talk about underneath my tricks of the trade, if you had that in front of you, is altered modality. Okay, If something's in major, put it in minor. Uh, if something is in minor, put it in major. It might be an entire arrangement, right? You might take, you know, uh, something that's done, you know, in a typically major key, and, and the entire thing might be moved into minor or vice versa. Um, oftentimes what I'll do is I might not take the entire arrangement and move it into a new key, or I'm sorry, an altered key, you know, major to minor, but I might do a section of it. Uh, and again, this is, this is in your handout as well, so I hope you can eventually get this, uh, but one of the tunes in this book is uh, We Gather Together. Right, for Thanksgiving, and we gather together, of course, in a you know a major key. And there's a moment in the piece where I thought, you know, this might be kind of nice to to move it to minor. Uh, and so after we've we've presented in, in the key of ma uh, C major, the arrangement is in the key of C major. Then I give a short little interlude, and this is that interlude right here. And then I'm going to stop talking, and right here I move it into C minor. Can you hear the tune there? I 
decorate it a little bit with some filigree in the right hand, right? So moving things from one key into another, I'm, I'm not another key, but um, from major into minor is always um, always kind of an interesting thing to do. And I, I know, by the way, I'm playing the piano here. I realize that, that you know, nothing beats being in person. And when you're listening to me play, it might be crackling and popping. And, and if it is, I apologize for that. I know that keyboards do not always translate well going through Zoom. And I'm not sure how this platform is working, but uh, typically Zoom is not, uh, you know, not always the best. So, um, you know, we'll get through what we can today and then um, hopefully next year we'll all be back together. Uh, another thing that I, I love to do when I'm, I'm considering an arrangement, gang, is that I will think, okay, what is the style um, that this piece is typically associated with? And, you know, is it a, a melody that usually is done very um, traditional hymn-like? Um, and what I'll do is, is put it into a different style. Uh, right away, just boom, into a different style. And that, that automatically freshens things up a bit. Uh, so I want you to write that down that too. So, so far we've got altered time signatures. We've got offered mo uh, altered modality. We get change of style or genre. Uh, th there's a song in here, um, I Must Tell Jesus. And I had a, a lot of fun tinkering around with this one. Uh, I, I wanted to do it as a straight ahead um, gospel. Uh, arrangement, which I, I must tell Jesus, you usually do here in gospel, but it's usually in 3-4 or in kind of a 9-8. This is more in a 4-4 four, four feel. <laughs> Of a different little bit, bit of a different take on how that tune is normally done. Usually, it's got some kind of three, four, or nine, eight feel to it. A lot of times, people will ask me, "Okay, all this is great, but how do you learn to write in other styles?" Um, my background is as a jazz pianist. Actually, when I when I started college, I was a jazz piano major, and that that afforded me a lot of opportunities to play in a lot of different styles that, that I might not have otherwise done. But the big thing for me is, is always listening, uh, listening to as many different styles as I can. Um, I, I love to go and study what other people are doing. And, uh, and I love, honestly, I copy, you know, what, what folks are doing. Um, you know, here in a little bit, I'm going to talk about chord substitutions. And one of my great friends and mentors is, is Mark Hayes. And I asked Mark one time, I said, man, Mark, how in the world do you come up with all of these incredibly beautiful chord substitutions that you use? And he said, well, I don't know, but if you want to know how to learn them, just go and buy some of my piano books and copy them. And, you know, he really meant it. And I, so gosh, you know what I did? And I would go and see, you know, okay, when Mark's trying to write in a classical style, what is it that he does that, you know, kind of gets that flavor across? Uh, you know, when Joel Rainey, who's a great jazz pianist, when he's trying to write in a jazz style, what does he do, you know, to, to get that, that flavor across? So I, I have learned over the years to really listen, 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 and, and study uh, what all of my colleagues and friends are doing. Uh, I... Um, in, in one of my first books with Shawnee Press, I did an arrangement of Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. And I don't know if I can remember it all now, but I, I did it as a stride piano thing. It sounds like this. I don't know if you can hear that. Hopefully you can. Here's the tune. to make sure that I was very authentic to that style. And so you know what I did? I went and bought a whole bunch of stride piano books from everyone from Art Tatum 
to Teddy Wilson to uh, Fats Waller. And I really studied, okay, what do these guys do when they do this? Because I want to respect them and be accurate to what they're doing uh, and, and see if I can gain something from that that I can put into my arrangement. So um, I, I'll move on. But if you are wanting to, to be an arranger, uh, whether it's choral or piano or whatever, I think listening, listening, listening is always, um, and studying is always such a big deal. Um, one of the big things that, that you can do with, with any arrangement that, that, you, um, that you're working on is what I, I just touched on a little bit, which you, you hear, you know, we all know Mark Hayes. And when you, when you, you know, pick up a Mark Hayes book of piano solos, one of the first things you notice are all of these incredibly beautiful chord substitutions that just seem to freshen up the music in a way that, oh my gosh, wow, how did he do that? Um, and, and I'll tell you what, again, in learning to do that, I've done sessions on this before for Alleluia on chord substitutions and how you come up, how you come up with them. Not doing it this time, but I, I have in the past. And again, going and buying books and studying what folks do uh, and trying to theoretically help uh, figure it out is, is so helpful. There are a couple of resources that I would recommend to you uh, if you are interested in them. Um, there, there's a great book out called The Jazz Theory Book. And, you know, a lot of chord substitutions and reharmonizations and all that kind of stuff, a lot of it comes from jazz. A lot of it comes from the harmonic vocabulary developed by um, jazz pianists and jazz musicians over, you know, the course of the last hundred years. And this book is, it's by a guy named Mark Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E, -E, Mark Levine, and it's called the Jazz Theory Book. Incidentally, he also has a great book out called The Jazz Piano Book, which, you know, most jazz pianists kind of consider to be the Bible, almost, of, of jazz piano theory. But um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about chord substitutions and how, how these things occur, The Jazz Theory Book, man, uh, I mean, I would, as soon as this session is over, I would go to Amazon and buy it. It, it tells you every, exhaustingly. It tells you everything you could possibly want to know from tritone substitutions to, I mean, what have you, things that can really get thick in the weeds from a theoretical point of view. There are also a couple of really good theory books. And if you'll let me, uh, I'm wearing blue jeans today, so I apologize as I scoot away from my desk. Um, my favorite theory book that I recommend to everyone is this guy right here. And I can put this in the uh, chat. But it's Music in Theory and Practice by Bruce Benward. And there are quite a few things in there that explain um, how folks go about creating chord substitutions and some of the uh, uniqueness of that and how you can all of a sudden take, you know, what a friend we have in Jesus, and you can end up doing something, you know, kind of cool with it that no one, no one has thought about before. Um, I, I'm another thing that I, I mentioned to you, Mark Hayes, that Mark is a, is one of my big mentors. Mark um, told me one time, I, I used to take composition lessons from Mark, really. Um, I lived in Kansas for a while. I live, uh, I'm in Bastrop, Texas, uh, just outside of Austin, but uh, I lived up in Kansas for a bit. Mark is in Kansas City, and uh, every couple of months I would drive out and, and I would work with him. It was wonderful. And um, Mark would just throw out all these little tidbits of information, you know, these little hints. And he told me one time, you know, Brad, when you're crafting an arrangement, after about every 8 to 12 bars, you want to change somehow the texture of the arrangement. You want it to change somehow. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a major change, but, but some kind of change to keep the pianist interested. If the melody is in the right hand, put it in the left hand. Uh, you know, if, uh, if, if the left hand is accompanying with big, beautiful arpeggios, uh, maybe let the uh, left hand start accompanying with, with blocked chords. 
just do something to change the texture about every um, 10 or 12 bars, eight to 12 bars. Now, where do you come up with this stuff? You know, again, I, I will point you to, you know, there are so many great writers that are out there right now doing wonderful piano writing. Uh, you can check out my books. You can check out Mark. You can check out Joel Rainey. You can check out Lloyd Larson, Larry Shackley, Molly Imes, Dan Forrest. Uh, I, I mean, it, the list just goes on and on and on and on. Mary McDonald, uh, Patty Drennan. I mean, I, I hate to even start naming names because I'll, I'll leave off someone's favorite. But I would check and see, you know, what kind of what kind of texture that, that they use, how where they change textures. In one of the pieces in my book, uh, this new book that I have out, um, there's an arrangement in there that I'm particularly proud of. It's it's an arrangement of Sweet Hour of Prayer, which has always been a very meaningful hymn to me. And when the, the melody first appears, I kind of give it this little light, esoteric thing, if you can hear it. I'm up in the range of the piano. <laughs> right, that. When the melody, when it comes back one more time, uh, or when it comes back an additional time, I want to change that texture a little bit. And so I, I change the texture by giving it almost something kind of akin to what Debussy might do. Um, I'll, I'll play you just a snippet of it. This is an interlude, so this is... Here it comes. If you can hear what I'm doing there, almost kind of watery sounding arpeggios. I got this from Debussy, from one of the preludes. Right. And then later on, a couple of bars later, I, I want to change the texture again. And so I do something a little bit more traditional hymn style. Right. That that kind of a deal. So where do you find these textures? Boy, you, you study what other folks are doing. I get a lot of them from classical music. I, I assume that that most of you here are, are obviously your pianists. Uh, you probably are somewhat familiar with, with classical repertoire. Maybe you're very familiar with it. And I, I, I sometimes, when I just don't have ideas for, man, how, how do I want to set this? I'll go downstairs to my library and I'll pull out a book of Brahms or pull out some Chopin or, uh, you know, Debussy in this case and just kind of say, huh, I wonder how, what kind of textures they use and what can I do to copy, copy that? Um, I, I can't tell you enough that there is just nothing new under the sun. And, and if you've been in my sessions before at Alleluia, uh, I've talked a lot about the creative process and that we all borrow and, and uh, take from those that have come before us. Originality is hiding your sources, right? Uh, kind of a funny line, but there's a whole lot of truth in that. And so I, again, I get so much ideas for my own piano arranging from studying what, what has come before. Now, uh, we've got about 20 minutes left. I am going to bust through um, a couple of things and just write down what you can uh, that you feel might be helpful to you. Again, with the tricks of the trade, and you don't have your hand out, but what we talked about uh, were you can experiment with altered time signatures. You can take things that are major and move them to minor or vice versa. That's altered modality. A change of style or genre. You know, uh, if something is typically done in this style, try it in a totally different style. Chord substitutions and harmonizations. I really didn't talk a whole lot about that because that really is a class in and of itself on how you create those things. Um, but I've hopefully given you some resources that can help um, point you in a direction where you can learn uh, about that. And then also this idea of contrasting textures and, and studying music to see, you know, where texture changes and what are the different, you know, ways of writing for the piano that you can experiment with. Now, when you're setting out, so we'll move through this pretty quick now. When you're setting out to do an arrangement, 
I, I don't do this too much anymore because I've just done enough of them that I'm, I'm comfortable starting out without a roadmap. But when I first started doing a piano arranging, I was a little bit more meticulous about it. I would actually create kind of a, a form, a roadmap, really. I, I would take a sheet of paper and I would write down on it, okay, I'm going to arrange uh, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I'm going to say that I'm going to write a four-bar introduction, so measures one through four, that's going to be my intro. Um, I don't know how many measures, what a friend we have in Jesus, how long it is, but 16 bars, whatever it is. Uh, okay, that would. then after the intro, I'm going to go through the tune. Then after that, I'm going to probably need to have some kind of an interlude. We're going to need to have some buffer material before we go right back into, into a, the melody again. So maybe four bars of buffer. Uh, then maybe there'll be another verse in a contrasting style. Maybe after that, I'm just doing this off the top of my head. After that, I might change keys and and do the third verse in a in a uh, more of a broad, you know. Um, <laughs> my daughter is down there singing like an idiot. I don't know if you can hear her or not. Um, she's been sick the last couple of days too, but obviously she's feeling better. Uh, and then after that, there might be some kind of, uh, you know, after that final verse, there might be some kind of uh, outro or ending. And so I would actually kind of write out the form um, of, of what I was going to do that way. Not that I would be glued to it, but that way, as, as I started writing the arrangement, I didn't feel like I was just uh, having to pull all this stuff out of thin air. I had a little bit of a roadmap that I could follow. And so I would encourage you to do that. Here's another great exercise, by the way, is to take someone else's arrangement, okay? Take, uh, my, uh, you know, any arrangement I've done or Molly Imes or anyone, this arrangement I was doing of uh, um, Sweet Hour of Prayer, and, and dissect what I'm doing here. Uh, okay, I can just tell you I have an eight-bar introduction, and then I have the melody, uh, how many ever measures that lasts, and then I have uh, a uh, four-bar interlude. No, actually, it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight-bar interlude, and then the melody comes back again, then a two-bar interlude, and then a key change. Um, you, you figure out the form that people are doing, and then copy it. Use, use whatever template that, that I've used or... or you know, Lloyd Larson has used, or Larry Shackley has used, or Joseph Martin has used. Use that template as something to put your own arrangement in. It is so helpful to do that, and then you feel like you're not having to recreate the will, so to speak. So, um, modulations. Okay, most arrangements are going to have some kind of modulation in them. I'm going to give them to you real quick because I, I know we started late. We have 16 minutes left. Um, write these down for me. There's four of them that I want to talk to you about. One is called a pivot chord. Pivot chord. P-I-V-O-T chord. One is called chromatic inflection. Chromatic inflection. One is called common tone. And one is called direct modulation. Direct modulation. Now, the one that is the most common of all these is the second one I gave you, chromatic inflection. That is uh, basically where I'm in the key of G major, and let's say I want to move to A flat. So at the end of, you know, my verse, or whenever I'm ready to modulate up, I uh, find the dominant of the key that I'm going into. In this case, it would be E flat, right? E flat is the dominant of A flat major. Um, it's very typical church pianist modulation. Uh, so if I'm doing Amazing Grace, because that's in the key of G. And we're coming into that last stanza, and we want to do the obligatory key change. Okay, there's E flat major, and now that I'm, I'm into A flat. It probably is the less creative of uh, the different key changes that, that you can use. Uh, but it's still, nonetheless, very, very effective. That's chromatic inflection. A type of um, modulation that is a little bit less known is something called a pivot chord. Brahms 
was a master of the pivot chord. And here's the deal. And again, I know this gets a little bit into the weeds theory wise. But what you do with a pivot chord modulation is you find one chord that is common to the key that you're currently in and also common to the key that you're going into. Okay, and you use that chord as really kind of a revolving door to move from one key into the next. Now, let, let's talk about that. Let me give you a really quick example. Uh, let's say I'm in the key of C major. Well, what are the, the chords that are naturally found in C major? We've got C major, we've got D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, and B diminished. And I know I might be over the head theory-wise for some folks, but hopefully most of you are tracking with me. If I wanted to move to the key of D major, from C major to D major, I could find some kind of chord that is found in both of those and use that as a revolving door to get me in. Um, e minor, let's try that. I'm in the key of C major. Let's just do the old body and soul harmonization. Okay, now here's my E minor chord. And then the next chord I'm going to do is an A7. And then I'm into the key of D, right? That was very, very simple and not a whole lot of grace to it. But it gives you the idea of what a, uh, a pivot chord is. It's actually a very sneaky way of moving from one key to the next. It can be very effective. One of my favorite types of modulations is something that we call a common tone modulation. Okay, so um, what do I mean by a common tone? Brahms was a master of this as well. Let's say that uh, I'm in the key of C major and I'm wanting to move to A flat. Okay, A flat major. Well, what I would do, the same thing with the uh, same rule would apply as with pivot chord, that I would take a tone that is found naturally in the C major scale and I would find uh, that same tone, maybe a common tone found in the A flat major scale, and I use that as the revolving door. So what about this? Let's say that, um, I mean, this is just kind of coming off the cuff here, but let's say that I'm finishing off something in the key of C major. So listen to this. I'll just improvise something. <laughs> did, I, I played it in the key of C, but when I got to C, I harmonized it with an A flat major chord, right? Because C, the tone C, is the root of the scale of C major, but it's the third of A flat major. And so it's kind of an interesting way to, to modulate. Direct modulation is also a really another common way that, that I like to modulate uh, when, I, when I am changing keys. And it's exactly what you think it might be. It's, it's with no preparation. Uh, it, it, you don't lay down any kind of dominant chord or anything like that. The very first song that I, I played for you, um, the uh, uh, Come You Thankful People Come, it has a direct modulation in it, right? I, I bring back this introductory material. <laughs> And then, right, all of a sudden we had that, that different key change right there. Uh, we had a key change right there, and it was direct, it was unprepared, it was very um, sudden. And the freshness of that is, is kind of invigorating. Now, like uh, what I told you about with the form, what I would tell you to do, uh, and, and I mean you can really, huh, you can spend so much time doing this, I would buy a book of piano solos from anyone, doesn't matter who it is, just a writer that you like. And I would go through and every time they modulate, every time one of their arrangements changes keys, I would see if you can figure out how they're doing it. I guarantee you it's going to be some iteration of either a pivot chord, a direct modulation, a common uh, tone modulation, or a chromatic inflection. That's really all we have to change keys. It, it really, in all of the limitlessness of music, folks really only do a couple of things. 
And so when you are playing through an offertory book of someone's arrangements that you like and you come to an especially beautiful modulation, figure out what kind it is and figure out how the arranger, how he or she made that happen. Uh, and then see if you can copy it. See if you can, you know, figure out a way you can incorporate that into your own writing. Again, Solomon had it exactly right when he says there's just nothing new under the sun. Uh, and you have to be able to, to start to glean from what other people are doing. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever thought of this or not, but introductions and endings. Uh, most composers and arrangers are like me, and they'll tell you that although the introduction is the very first thing, typically it's the last thing that I write. I, I never really start with an introduction. I, and there's some reasons for that that I think are reasonably good ones. Um, as the arrangement progresses, I, I might create some kind of interlude that is drawn out of the music, or I might find some kind of neat accompaniment pattern, you know, in the right hand or the left hand that might make a good introduction. And those things might not... Um, I might not discover those things until I'm well with, within the arrangement. So the introduction is usually the, the last thing that I write. But again, in all of the limitlessness of music, really there's a set amount of ways that we create an introduction. Here they are. Uh, you can create an introduction that's drawn from thematic material. Okay. Um, so in other words, you've got, you know, uh, you're arranging What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Well, you would draw a little snippet of melody from What a Friend We Have in Jesus, maybe, you know, a, a couple of notes that hint at the melody, and you would create an introduction based on it, okay? Um, another thing that you'll do uh, is create uh, introductions that are uh, drawn from the accompaniment, Okay. Uh, like I said, if you create some kind of a nice accompaniment pattern. And then lastly, and this is it. I mean, there, you really, there's just not that much. Um, introductions are sometimes freely composed material. Okay, so that introduction that I created um, on Come, You Thankful People Come, that's an, uh, a style of introduction that came from the accompaniment. As the song progressed, listen to my left hand. Once I started arranging it. That kind of a left-hand accompaniment. Well, I thought, how cool that is. I wonder if I could create an introduction from it. And so I did. Right? So there's an example of something that's drawn from uh, accompaniment patterns. Um, a, a minute ago, I played you that little gospel arrangement of um, I Must Tell Jesus. That's drawn from thematic material, right? If you think about the chorus of I Must Tell Jesus, I Must Tell Jesus, I Must Tell Jesus. Well, that's kind of what starts it. Now, it goes off and does something else. It doesn't stay there, but that introduction is drawn from the thematic material. One of the uh, types of introductions that I especially resonate with I don't know why, I guess it's the composer in me, but I enjoy doing what I call a freely composed introduction. Okay, so Sweet Hour of Prayer, if I can draw you back to that. This is the introduction that I came up with for Sweet Hour of Prayer. It really doesn't... I guess there's a little snippet of the melody there, but then it kind of goes off in its own realm. So that's the intro, right? It, it really, there is a little bit of, at the beginning, there is a little bit of thematic material there, but then I, I take it and kind of move off into a different direction with it. So your introductions are going to be one of really three things, drawn from thematic material, drawn from some kind of accompaniment pattern, or freely composed. I would say the same thing about your interludes. Your arrangement, you know, as you plot this out, your arrangement needs interludes. A very typical thing 
is that um, a lot of times interludes are the introduction that is coming back, right? You see that a lot in choral music. You see it a lot in, in piano arranging too. Um, they can be either drawn from thematic material from the accompaniment or they can be freely composed. And lastly, as I move into this final thing, I can't believe I'm going to cover all this. I've got four minutes left. Um, endings. As a writer, uh, as a choral composer, as a uh, piano arranger, I hate endings. Uh, they are the hardest thing for me to write. I don't know why. They just are. Uh, just drawing things into a satisfying conclusion is just always tough for me. I don't know why. But the truth is, there's really only four ways. One, two, three, four. There's really only four ways that, that endings are constructed in, in a piece of music. You can have a repetition of the last phrase. We've all heard that before, right? You know, uh, back to Amazing Grace. Uh, when we've been there 10,000 years, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And then repeat, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun, right? We, we, we understand repetition of final phrase. It's a tried but true thing, but it's very effective. You can augment the final phrase, and we all know exactly what I mean with this. Uh, that you repeat the last phrase, but you elongate it, you augment it, you, you make it usually twice its value, uh, and that brings it to a, a final conclusion. A lot of times it's very effective in your piano arranging to bring back the introduction. If you found out, or if you created an especially beautiful introduction, or you've got an idea for one, uh, it's a nice bookend technique to... Uh, place that at the end. It kind of creates a nice sense of form, a nice sense of inevitability that I think is a uh, is very valuable uh, when we're arranging. And then the last thing that you can do, which I do again quite a, a bit of, is I'll do a, a freely composed arrangement, or ending rather, I'm sorry, uh, where I will, you know, just for instance, if I can pull up that sweet hour of prayer one more time, um, and I think I might have had this in the handout too, but um, I'm repeating the last phrase a couple of times. But then listen to this. This is just totally new. It's a nice little chord progression that I found. Probably got it from a Marquez book, I don't know, where I initially heard it. And it's just a freely composed little intro that kind of tucks things into bed nicely. I love doing that kind of stuff. So, as we wrap everything up, uh, in, in 45 minutes or so, we've covered a lot. I, I've given you tricks of the trade. I, I've, I've touched on the different types of modulations that we use, pivot chromatic inflection, common tone, and direct modulation. We've talked about how introductions and interludes are either drawn from thematic material or uh, they're drawn from the accompaniment or maybe they're freely composed. Endings are the same way. We've talked about, you know, some of the common tricks of the trade that arrangers use, like putting it in a different time signature or switching major to minor or... Um, cool little chord substitutions and things like that. So the thing that you really now have to do, um, and what I always encourage folks to do, is find the writers that you love, find arrangements that you love. If you love what Heather Swordson does in her books, that's awesome. She's the best of the best. Take some of these concepts that I've talked about and go in there and study what Heather's doing. Okay, how does she create this introduction? Is it something that she gets from some little thematic snippet of the tune? Uh, or is it something freely composed? What about her ending? What kind of chord substitutions is she using in this that makes it so good? What about, um, you know, the, the uh, changing keys, if she's changing keys? What technique does she do? Uh, and you go in and you start analyzing what folks do, and, and then you can kind of start to think the way they think and start to uh, start to copy some of these things and, and implement them in your own piano arranging. So we have 18 seconds left. Um, 
and I apologize we were late getting started. I also apologize I've been a little foggy today. I just, I'm not feeling really good today for some reason. Um, anyway, I, I hope that this has been helpful for you. Uh, I'm very appreciative uh, that you guys have given me this session. And I hope that Michael, you're able, maybe, or someone is able to get this handout to them. And um, do we have any questions at all before we finish up? Our time is out. Um, Lily is the last one who wrote. Uh, she said, I can't see the handout. I don't see anything else. Michael, are you there, my friend? Okay, I guess he's not around. But uh, thank you so much, folks. I appreciate it. And um, blessings to you. And let's hope that at the next Alleluia that we have, we can all be together. And uh, even so with virtual uh, Zoom, I hope that, that this is helpful for you and you're enjoying the sessions. Okay, blessings, everyone. We'll talk to you later. Thank you, Dodie. I see that. Uh, extremely helpful. Thank you. You bet, Lily. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, everyone. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you later, okay? Bye-bye. Okay,